And um, we have a traveling mic, we have a mic in back. Uh, Sheldon, I think you were first. Hi, Sheldon Ray, Morgan Stanley. On the subject of excessive executive pay in the banking industry, which has been a major factor, I believe, what does the panel think um, the effects of more deferred compensation clawbacks could have on the industry to modify uh, unethical and irresponsible behavior? And if it does have a positive impact the next few years, could the government mandate such a thing and how? Does anyone in particular want to talk about that? I guess <clears throat> Professor I, I think without needing a mandate, she, Sheila will correct what, what I say. <laughs> I, I think without needing a mandate, compensation committees generally are kind of moving by themselves in this direction, uh, looking at best practices where more and more of the compensation is based on performance, uh, deferred, uh, clawbacks, whatever what the terminology is today. I've seen just having served on corporate boards over the years and is still on a couple of large ones. Uh, that there is more innovative thinking going toward compensation and basing it on real results of the firm than, uh, than ever before. And that's not driven by any sense of an overall mandate. It's driven by a compensation committee that's saying, we got a lot of eyes on us like never before. The company has a lot of eyes on them, and that should be motivation enough to kind of begin to do, do, do the right thing. Great. Right. Sheila, do you want to add anything? Yeah, just that I think Morgan Stanley's been doing some some positive things uh, in, in this area, and uh, and, and uh, top management and boards uh, should be uh, focused on it. You know, we, we have so much regulation now, and it's so prescriptive. You can do this, you can't do that, and and I think it's so much more effective to look at underlying economic incentives, what's driving the behavior to begin with, and so you know, it, it, compensation systems that are are, are less skewed towards uh, you know. Uh, uh, swinging for the bleachers and more about stable uh, performance over time, I, I think is, is absolutely a positive thing. And you can debate whether the government should have a role or whether the board sh should take a leadership, but whoever is doing it uh, absolutely needs to be focused on this. And greater equilibrium between your variable pay and your, and your base salary, I think, is a positive move. I think using convertible debt uh, as part of the variable uh, piece of the pay package is good because with, with, with convertible debt, uh, you know, your upside is just your, your return, your, your interest on the debt. You got a lot of downside if the bank gets into trouble. You got a lot of downside with convertible debt. So I think innovations along those lines are extremely helpful. And again, tackling the economic incentives that give us this behavior, I think, it can be a lot more effective than these prescriptive, highly prescriptive rules. And I would, I would add just one sentence, and that is, I, I just think these pay packages that the public sees, and I, I'm not really speaking only about Wall Street, but especially there, just undermines people's faith and in our government and in our econ economic e e economic system when they see this kind of pay. I mean, for, you know, for 10 years, uh, most of America has not gotten a raise when you get right down to it. Most of America has seen stagnant wages and costs go up and a very small, I mean, that's a very small number of people have done very, very well, not just Wall Street, but a number of companies. And uh, it just, it really does. I mean, this is, this really is a country where we've thought for Decades and decades, we're in this together. I don't, sounds a bit platitudinous, perhaps, but I, I do think it's something to think about. I'm not saying that government should come in with a heavy hand. I like what what the governor said about the compensation boards are getting a little more prudent about it. I, I hope they continue. I, I just it's a really long sentence. No, no, no. <laughs> just just for the record, your long sentence gives me an excuse to plug some of the institute's work. With the support of the Aranda Foundation, we have a major two-year study underway on inequality across countries, um, what business activities can do about it and how they contribute or not, including Robert Lawrence, Danny Blanchard, Jacob Kierkegaard, and myself working on this. And so we are sharing that concern and trying to contribute to that discussion um, at the back microphone. Um, Joe Marie, Grease Scrubber, New Rules for Global Finance. Uh, I first want to say I'm very encouraged by listening to this panel. I usually am horribly depressed. Um, I wanted to ask two quick questions. What have ever happened to trust busting in the United States? Don't those laws still exist on the books? And why isn't the Justice, Depart Justice Department busting up some trusts? Um, secondly, the FDA. Uh, we we try test at least medicines before they go on the market. Why can't financial innovations be tested beforehand for their impact? Then maybe management would understand what's going on. And third, I want you to know that there is a wide-ranging uh, coalition of lots of grassroots groups, small businesses, academics, religious, working on fact, 
Financial Accountability and Corporate Transparency is our acronym, dreamt up over a good big bottle of beer <laughs> one night. But I want you to know that there's active campaigning on these issues, and we would love to have you get engaged with it. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, again, uh, Joe Marie, I'm delighted to see her bounding with enthusiasm, but um, sorry, that was a joke, I guess not. Um, they, uh, she didn't direct a question, so if anybody wants to pitch in on the, her two quick points. Yeah, well, the, on trust busting, I, you know, it, it's concentrated, but they still compete with each other, so I think, uh, I think it can be difficult. I'm not an antitrust lawyer, so. Uh, uh, but I've, I've talked to antitrust lawyers who are more knowledgeable, and I think there's still enough, a sufficient level of competition that using that tech uh, to tackle this uh, under the current law may not be uh, what you can do. Uh, on FDA, FDA, you know, the FDA model, uh, product approval, pre-approval, um, that had very short life with the consumer agency for consumer products and, and really got a very negative reaction. I, I think there's still you know, some sense in this country, we like innovation if it's responsible innovation, uh, and the concern was that you would get into uh, too much of a bureaucratic process. Uh, whether that's right or not, I don't know. I will say that we do have safety and soundness regulation, though, and, and consumer regulation of these institutions. So they're doing, if they're launching products that are abusive to customers or are not safe and sound. Uh, there are rules in place and examiners whose job it is to go in there and find those uh, that to stop it already and and uh, I do believe that uh, we need to be more uh, proactive uh, in using those regulatory tools and nip things in the bud don't let you know subprime get completely out of control before we figure out it's a it's a problem so I do think there's some some current tools to uh, try to stop uh, abusive products before they get out of hand but we need to use them like anything I would add only that um your grassroots efforts, I think we, I don't, at least I, I know I didn't mention one of the reasons I think things have moved more quickly than, than most of us thought on, on a lot of these, what's happening in the Senate is because of grassroots efforts. I think people are more educated on these issues, much more than they were five years ago, the, the general public and, and um, what, I mean, I just went through a really big re-election campaign, I mean, big in terms of dollars and every other way, and I, I just saw the power of the internet better than I ever saw it as somebody that just turned 60. Uh, and I think that what's happening with grassroots efforts will have an impact on this too. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm uh, Pat Malloy. I, I'm a trade lawyer and I teach trade law at Catholic University Law School. But I was uh, 15 years on the staff of the Senate Banking Committee, and I very much agree with Senator Brown's point that the strength of the financial community has had an enormous impact on trade policy in this country and the outsourcing. But I want to come to the other issue. When I was on the Banking Committee staff, we did the Regal Neal Interstate Banking and Branching Act. We were very concerned about the political strength of the financial community. And uh, we decided, and this was under Senators uh, Regal, Sarbanes, and Garn, that we should put concentration provisions and the antitrust division told us we didn't need them. But we said, no, we're more concerned with the political strength. So we said if a bank gets more than 10% of the banking assets of the country, it can no longer expand by acquisition. And I'm always wondered what happened to, to that provision? How did they get around that to be able to get this enormous power? You wrote about well, that. Uh, unfortunately, in your prescience, uh -huh and you were prescient not to worry about the political concentration, you put the cap as a percent of retail deposits. And this is in the mid-1990s. And the big expansion that we had that we've all talked about since the mid-1990s was not particularly in retail deposits. It was in what we loosely call wholesale, wholesale funding. Now, Dodd-Frank did change the language. So now if you have more than 10% of total liabilities of the financial system, you are restricted in terms of your ability to expand through acquisition. But still, there are many, many including, I think, <laughs> me and, 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 and the panelists can speak for themselves, who feel that that cap in Dodd-Frank is, is too loose, it's not binding. And even, even Dan Terullo at the Fed has indicated that the, the, the Fed may take a, a, a tougher, more stringent, more restrictive view on when they let a banks uh, expand. Simon, that. could you give us one to two more sentences on when you say it's not binding? Why is 10% on liabilities insufficiently binding? Well, I, th I think the, the uh, issue to worry about there, Adam, is, is um, think historically and comparatively about what happened to Japan in the, 19, in the 1980s, which, which you know about more, more than anyone. But when you, when you have, again, let me speak loosely, some sort of bubble, some sort of expansion in the financial system that's not justified by, by what's 
by the real economy or by what can be sustained in the future, financial liabilities will expand a lot relative to GDP. So banks could become very big, even if they're only 10% of this much larger number. That's why I, I'm drawn very much to the cap on size of bank balance sheet relative to GDP, relative to the real economy, because that's an indication of how much damage you can do to the real economy. And, and I, I, again, I, I recommend strongly the, the Tom Hoenig adjustment, um, which is essentially using international accounting standards <coughs> over US GAAP to think about bank size with regard to potential danger. But that, that's banks relative to the real economy. It's simple, it's straightforward, it makes sense. It's, it's somewhat more bubble proof mm -hmm. than would be anything as percent of liabilities. Thank, thank you for specifying. Again, just to note, um, Simon and also Nicholas Veron on our staff are both writing about this comparison of using European versus American banking standards and what that does to how you understand bank size. Um, gentleman at the back microphone. Thank you. Danny Xu Fengjiang with China's Xinhua News Agency. Uh, I have a question for the panelists. What are your insights on the Troubled Asset Relief Program? the top program in terms of too big to fail. Is this program kind of worsening the too big to fail phenomenon? What lessons can we draw from this program? Thank you. I'm sure every member of the panel has an opinion on this. <laughs> um, Sheila did write a book on this. Yeah, <laughs> So, uh, you know, getting, getting back to Adam's earlier uh, point about was too big to fail really that much of a driver during the crisis, it had a role. It wasn't huge. But I think a lot of Dodd-Frank was trying to fix the 2008 bailouts, uh, the, the tremendous moral hazard that was created by bailing out uh, all these institutions. And, and, and you know, going down to uh, not that uh, large, we, pretty much in 2009 we said anything over $100 billion we're going to bail out. So. I do think uh, there was, uh, you know, you did what you had to do. Uh, I was a part of this. I had uh, concerns with, with some of it, uh, which I voiced at the time and continue to voice. Uh, we, I think we, we did dial some of it back. But uh, it is what it is, uh, but it created tremendous moral hazard, and that's why Title I and Title II of Dodd-Frank are really all about trying to identify institutions that are systemic early on and making them unsystemic, not to bail them out, <laughs> but to make them unsystemic, to get to the point where they can be, they can fail in a bankruptcy. And then there's a bank up, backup process in Title II, which is basically an FDIC run bankruptcy, but you still have the shareholders and the unsecured creditors taking losses as they do in bankruptcy. So, um, you know, don't go there. Uh, get ahead of it now. And uh, this is why I personally and a lot of others have been frustrated with uh, the slowness of doing Title I designations, which is basically the AIG provision, just to give the government the tools to those who are not already uh, subject to prudential supervision to identify those that are sufficient, sufficient size, it's really interconnected, it's more than size, that could have systemic impact, and identify them early and supervise them and make sure they, through the living well process, that they can, they can demonstrate and make whatever structural changes they need they can fail in a bankruptcy. Um, so a lot of Dodd-Frank's really was about correcting the 2008 bailouts, not so much, a lot of it was about the subprime crisis too, but a lot of it was undoing the damage of 2008. Very interesting perspective. So I remember um, very vividly, I was in Zanesville, Ohio in September, um, on a September day in 2008, when uh, a little town in Eastern Ohio, old industrial town that's, that's had some pits on it, still a good place, and uh, I got a call from Majority Leader's office saying that Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke want, want to talk to the Banking Committee. At, this was at noon, and he said he's going to call at two, and that was when uh, Secretary, well, Secretary Bernanke, or Chairman Bernanke sort of laid out the, the severity of all of this as much as you could in ten minutes, and then Paulson asked for his three-page bill um, for seven hundred billion dollars, which. Uh, Elected officials don't always respond well to requests like that. And we, I mean, we, we talked about it. I, my, I remember when I went home that night, my wife said she had never seen me quite look that way in terms of the, the, the just, just how overwhelming and scary it was. And you know, we, we did what we had to do, as Sheila said. But I, I, I often, when facing a, a really complicated, sort of difficult vote, I will just for myself, not, not usually share it, I'll write down. Uh, Go, why vote for this, why not vote for this? And I remember at the top of it, I wrote the, the best vote I ever cast and the worst vote I ever cast. And I, I mean, you, you, just, I, you just knew you had to do it for this financial system. I, it also led to another thing probably 
Peterson Institute hates, and that is the auto rescue. But um, no, no, actually, okay, that you, one you did. Okay, okay, okay. mixed. Uh, that, okay. Pure economists would know. You know, not that you're not a pure. Economist, uh, but um, <laughs> never mind. But I, I, you know, I think that it, it, it. I mean, it was um, it was something as to show said some we had to do what we had to do there, and I, I think it was generally success, and I think it saved much much disaster for our country. But not one we want to repeat. <laughs> yeah, not exactly. That's that, that's really the significant thing. We never want to repeat that situation, of course. Um, John, did you want to well, come on this? I want to my colleagues to say is John Hall. Show off. We tried that. At, we tried that in the Republican think, debates. It didn't work out quite. Yeah. Well. <laughs> That's because I got so darn bored in that debate. I was I impressed, though. Yeah, really I was really impressed. I liked it. My colleagues have said it all. <laughs> On that note, um, Ted Truman and then the lady in front here. Uh, so I want to thank the senator for uh, making Adam this say. Is, this is Ted, Ted Truman. Ted Truman, I'm at Peterson Institute for International Economics, but I want to comment that you made uh, Adam's day by calling him an impure economist. Yeah. Uh, uh, so my question is uh, on this too big to fail question is that um, uh, notwithstanding uh, the fact that I don't think we have much facts about the advantages of size and scale and so forth and so on, I think the literature is pretty weak on that. Um, I can blame actually the academics as much as the, as the uh, politicians on this uh, and the regulators. But um, I, I, I have trouble getting off and getting my hands around the fact that uh, uh, we need to distinguish between dealing with an individual institution, which gets into trouble and liquidating it, uh, and a general lemming effect, which affects all institutions, uh, large and small. Uh, the best example, uh, Recent example in the United States, of course, is the saving of the loan institution, saving the loan crisis, which were a bunch of small institutions. Notwithstanding that there weren't some regulatory flaws that led to that, the capacity to be lemmings. But the point is, they were all lemmings uh, in this case. And uh, and when you have uh, a systemic problem in terms of a bubble, if you want to put it that way, uh, whether you're dealing with institutions which are 10 percent of GDP or 5 percent of GDP or 3 percent of GDP you end up in the same uh, general situation. So I'd be interested in anybody on the panel who wanted to comment on the distinction between the individual institution that's too big to fail and the systemic problem of many institutions at the same time who may end up being, uh, having to be, for many of the same reasons, uh, rescued. I don't use the word bailout for obvious reasons because of my own background. Thank you. Um. So I, I think this is also a, a something I talked a lot about in my book. Uh, it, I think it's fallacy to think of this crisis as something that everybody did. Certainly everybody made mistakes. But there were clear outliers here, uh, institutions that were clearly insolvent, that should have gone through some type of bankruptcy restructuring, uh, that did not. And uh, we did get to the point where the market got so confused uh, towards the end of 2008 that the, the, the funding markets uh, seized up. And that was creating a particular problem for those who relied on a lot of wholesale funding even those who did have an adequate capital base. But the traditional commercial banks that did not do uh, a lot of the stupid things and had uh, good, uh, strong deposit franchises and, and higher capital levels because we had fought off uh, these Basel II advanced approaches for them, so they had higher capital levels, they really were not in trouble. Uh, and I think it's, it's fallacy to think this whole thing was just everybody uh, was in trouble. That's just not the case. They were clear outliers. And going forward, what the, the, the Dodd-Frank framework is, is that you now have a process for the insolvent institutions. It, actually, Dodd-Frank requires that they be run through a, a either bankruptcy or a government control-based bankruptcy that would be run by the FDIC. And you do, if you have a true system-wide problem, there is the ability to provide some generally available system-wide support uh, for solvent institutions. And gosh, but if we ever did get into a, a system-wide uh, seizing up of public confidence, uh, that you would, where there'd be liquidity problems for otherwise uh, healthy institutions, and we certainly saw that in the wake of the market crash of 1929, you would have these multiple tools. But the insolvent ones, and, and they're there, and you know who they are. The regulators knew who they were. The markets knew who they were. We weren't kidding anybody. Uh, now they will go through a bankruptcy run process, and they will be restructured, and that's what you want. It's not punitive, it's not, uh, you know, it's not justice, maybe it's a little bit of that, but it's what works for the economy to prop up these very sick institutions with these huge volumes of legacy assets 
These banks don't go out and do a lot of blue lending. They, they nurse their balance sheet. They deal with their litigation. They deal with their loan restructuring. They're not going out there and making new small business loans. Restructure them, get them cleaned up, put the bad assets into a bad bank, spin off a good bank, one that's got good capital and can go out there and lend. That's what helps with economic recovery, and that's the piece that we didn't really, really do in 2009, and we should have. Yep, that's great. Um, the lady in front here. Hi, Nancy Jacqueline, Johns Hopkins Sice. I'd like to drill down a little bit on living wills, which you mentioned, which is really the existing a nuclear weapon <laughs> that already exists to try to, in our laws, to try to deal with um, um, banks that are too big to, to, too big to fail, too big to manage. And I wonder whether the uh, reluctance for uh, faster action, more action, what the politics are both internationally and domestically that are kind of preventing some, some real movement in this. Because I think all of us who have worked on the issue of too big to fail for 20 or 25 years knows it's going to be a very long time before the international legal system has a regime that permits a multinational bank that's highly interconnected to be wound up in an orderly way that doesn't create systemic risk by announcing the winding up, right? And so why isn't this happening? I mean, you have the universal banks in Europe. Is it the, the international political um, resistance to trying to restructure the system differently? How much of it is just an unwillingness of Congress to tell regulators to do the job that they are permitted to do under Dodd-Frank. Why are we not focusing in on the powers that are already there? Right? Yeah. We don't need new laws, basically, to solve this problem. Thank you. Well, I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I'd like to see it. Uh, there, there are powerful tools there. And I would like this uh, to ending too big to fail to be a much higher priority. Our singular focus in our, our regulatory system should now be to make sure that the markets understand uh, the cost of risk taking will be borne by them, not by the government, not by taxpayers. Uh, that by itself will make our system so much more stable. And it's been said, if we'd let one go down, if we'd let Citigroup go down, that would have probably had a, a much bigger impact than all the rules we are writing now. And so why this isn't a higher priority, a more urgent priority, uh, why there isn't a more muscular approach, uh, you know, I, I agree with you. Uh, the, on the international front, I mean, Europe just has a very Byzantine way of, of making decisions on anything, uh, including this. But the UK is a little more nimble. And I think there's been a lot of tremendous progress through the good work of the FDIC and the Bank of England and the FSA, which will soon become part of Bank of England, uh, to come up with, with a memorandum of understanding and protocols. And really, if you get the US and the UK, you've got a big, big chunk uh, of, the, of the global financial system, because certainly most of the uh, US firms' foreign operations are regulated through the UK system. And so, uh, at least in terms of in our space, I think if, if you get agreements there, and, and, and there's, there are agreements there already, you've, you've uh, gone a long way towards coming up with a viable model for resolution. But what I discussed earlier, higher capital and, and making sure there's a, enough debt at the holding company level to absorb losses is very important. And that can be done in the near term. Be before the other panelists um, respond, I just want to follow up momentarily on, on Nancy's point and sort of link it to Ted's Lemmings point. One way, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to this, it goes to some points that a number of you made about cognitive capture. You know, it's not outright corruption, but they listen to people who maybe don't look like me, look like John Huntsman. But anyway, they 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 listen they listen they listen to people in gray suits talking this, and and the academics and the academics all fell in, and the policymakers in both the Clinton and Bush administrations fell in, and the Fed people fell in. So I guess I guess the question is. If, if part of what happened was there was rules on the books, and as a matter of choice or intellectual climate, the people in charge chose not to keep the rules up to date, for example, in the way Simon was talking about with size issues, or chose not to enforce them, is there anything we can do about that, or is it we just hope that every few years we catch up and, and smack the regulators around and say, hey, wake up? Um, no, I mean, there's a serious point here. I mean, that, it, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. But it means, realistically, what do you do to actually stiffen the spine so that the intent of the law when passed in 1980 is still enforced in 2010? Uh, can I start with, with Sharon? Well, I, I guess you said it. I, I think we try. I think we, I mean, we, you know, this whole idea of, it seems there's sort of th three approaches. There's, there's figure out ways to do regulation better, 
but we know just the fact that all the Dodd-Frank rules have taken three years and they're still not they're still not written, let alone implemented and forced. And obviously, the Volcker rule is the most salient of them. Second is you you do better capital standards and better quality capital and, and stronger standards, and you tier them as as Sheila said. And third, you find some ways to limit liabilities and limit debt. And um, I think you need to do all of these tracks. And probably, maybe may, I mean, there's there's also in Congress discussion of. You know, what do you do with, with Glass-Steagall? And I think there, there, there's some cause for optimism, because I, you know, I, I, I don't know a, a whole lot about de Depression-era um, banking rules and kind of what came out of that. But it wasn't, it wasn't just one bill that passed Congress and one law that President Roosevelt signed. It was Glass, I believe Glass-Steagall was the first major one. And then there was movement after that when they saw other things that needed to happen. And I think that Dodd-Frank's not the only thing we're going to do. And I think over the next two or three years, we will see other, other things that Congress looks at doing. I think it's important to capture the moment and remember, remember where we are. We're just coming up for, for air after some really difficult years. I think we downplay the extent of the fear factor uh, somewhere between 08, 9, 10, I remember so well as a governor meeting with the National Governors Association behind closed doors with Bernanke uh, and hearing uh, how close we had come uh, based on his description uh, and how fragile the system was. And I think when you've got banks that are unhealthy, they don't lend. When you've got politicians and regulatory leaders who are insecure, they don't lead. And I think the whole system was frozen for a lot of that period. Uh, the mechanics were there for us to follow, the rules on the books, but who leads out and gets it done? I think we were frozen in time. That's why this moment now, I think, is so very, very important. We can reflect back, do an autopsy of sorts, and figure out how we move on in terms of our regulatory fixes, deal with subsidies, level the playing field, and begin to prepare for the next phase of growth. Great. Um, I, I don't want to be rude, but we have two more questions, so can I ask Simon and Sheila to hold off on that? Um, if, if I could, I'd just like to ask, I'm not trying to put people on the spot, but I'd like to ask the two people to pose their questions and then we'll get final comments from the panel. Please. Uh, Shaheen Nasiripour with the Financial Times. Um, you know, I've been writing about Too Big to Fail a lot over the last couple of years, and one thing that's always, the argument that's always made to me by those who are against either breaking up the institutions or putting a size cap is they bring up they, they say that the issue isn't so much that some institutions are too big to fail, that rather they're too interconnected to fail. So they bring up, for example, Bear Stearns, uh, or in some cases, Lehman Brothers. And so I'm wondering if the concern, uh, from your perspective, is it a more of a financial stability concern that these institutions are too interconnected and so they must be reduced somehow in size or scope so as to limit those interconnections, or whether there's a greater concern on the fact that some of these institutions, you know, enjoy, a, you know, an unfair subsidy due to their size, or they're too concentrated in the financial system, they dominate too much of, you know, retail markets, et cetera. I mean, which, I guess, which is the greater concern to you? Is it more of kind of the, the bigness of the institution and, and the cost that imposes on the economy, or is it kind of the interconnections and the implications for financial stability? Because if it's the latter, I wonder if it wouldn't be more prudent to simply uh, impose really strict and stringent single counterparty credit uh, limits where you effectively limit the ability of institutions to have various exposures to one another. And so I'd be grateful to get your thoughts on that. It's a, it's a long question, but it's pretty specific, so we should be able to get some good answers out of that. Tom? Um, yeah, Tom Glessner from Gave Investments. <clears throat> I had the, uh, either the good pleasure or misfortune of being at Citigroup for six years uh, during the crisis. So. So my question, after witnessing what I thought was abysmal risk governance for a protracted period of time, and since you met, many of you talked a little bit about, uh, sort of skirted that, you know, you sort of talked a little bit about that, I would be very interested to hear uh, anyone on the panel of you, uh, Shayla in particular, what changes would you like to see in the risk governance process, all the way down to, well, so chief risk officers, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, traders have probably undue influence in lots of institutions. Um, there are lots of interesting reasons why. It's a very complex kind of micro issue, but it would be interesting to hear your views. Thank you very much. So we have two. Th this panel has been great showing their depth of knowledge and engagement, and we have two very 
substantive questions to go out on. So, and I do want Simon to also get the chance to talk. So why don't we start with Simon and just run across the panel. Uh, Shaheen, to, you, to your question, uh, nobody ever said making the banks smaller was a sufficient condition for financial stability. The point is it's necessary. You need it as part of other safeguards you're putting in place. And, and I, would, I would stress the, the Safe Banking Act proposed by Senator Brown is not just about size, it's also about restricting leverage. And a big part of our problems with interconnectedness come because we allow so much leverage to build up. Bear Stearns and, and Lehman Brothers were, as you know, very high, among the most highly leveraged institutions we've ever allowed to operate in, in this country. They were not big in the sense of current JP Morgan Chase, which is $4 trillion under the Hoenig measure. They were about five to $600 billion, but they were big enough with a lot of leverage. And there are other things that you should consider, including the counterparty, counterparty caps. And, and Tom, I, I, I think you're, you put your finger on it. The, 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 and Jeremy Stein, the governor of the Federal Reserve, said something very similar in a recent speech. There's a profound failure of, of governance repeatedly in these large, complex financial institutions. And I don't think there is a fix from the outside or from inside that will comprehensively and forever remove that danger. You need multiple safeguards. And again, I think you need something very much like the Safe Banking Act, very much like what John Huntsman is proposing on, on fees and on, on capital charges, and very much uh, what Sheila Baer is proposing in, in, her, in her book. Sheila? So uh, if I had to pick between size and interconnectedness, I would clearly go with interconnectedness. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, size gets into some problems too, especially with, with market dominance and political uh, influence. But in terms of immediate shocks to the system, it's the interconnected firm that worries me a lot more. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, a big bank that takes deposits and make loans, even if you're, you know, a more than a trillion dollar bank that takes deposits and make loans, I don't worry about them so much because I know they've got a stable funding base. I know there's an established resolution mechanism to deal with them. It's easy to break them up and figure, you know, geographically and figure out uh, what to go where. Uh, but if they got a big derivatives book, they got a lot of wholesale funding, it's, it's a real nightmare. And so uh, I think uh, it, 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 you have to recognize the interconnectedness problems in the context of defining too big to fail institutions. And you have to look at the credit exposures, absolutely. That's part of the living well process, one that's not looked at as much as it should be. But there's something called credit exposure reports that are supposed to be part of the living wells. And these big banks are supposed to, well, anybody over 50 billion in assets is supposed to identify, okay, if I get in trouble, who else is going to go down because I'm in trouble? And vice versa, who else is out there if they get in trouble is going to take me down? Identify those in advance and, and get rid of them. So uh, I, again, that's another tool, very powerful tool that regulators have. Uh, are, are they using them? In terms of how we compensate uh, chief, risk, chief risk officers, I think they should be compensated very well. Uh, their value is, is, is every bit as important as the traders that maybe uh, on a, uh, on a uh, one-off basis can, can shoot for the moon and, and generate a, a big deal and also potentially put a lot of risk uh, on, the, on the financial institution's balance sheet as well. Uh, I don't think chief risk officers should be paid based on trading profits. Uh, I, you know, I would like to have them to get big bonuses when the hedges they put on correlate with the underlying risk. Wouldn't that be nice? You know, a perfect correlation should get you a really big bonus if you're a chief risk officer. So those are the kinds of things I wish uh, management would think about in terms of uh, how they compensate people who have a very important function, which is to keep them out of trouble. John? You know, I think interconnectedness aside, uh, I've got to say that the, probably the subsidy issue is the one that uh, is going to drive the debate more than anything else from a political standpoint because I think that's inexorably tied to the whole issue of trust uh, with a system that seems to be rigged uh, against uh, a lot of players. And so when, you, when you're facing a trust gap as it is in politics generally, and you overlay yet uh, an additional trust gap on the financial services side, which has always been uh, a centerpiece of, of trust and believability, at least in my years growing up, and that begins to change, I think you see a very serious eroding of, uh, of, of people's view of our institutions of power, whether they be political or financial, directly tied to the whole subsidy issue. And that's where I think this discussion kind of ends up going longer term and why I do believe it's going to be uh, an issue to be dealt with uh, at some point. And listen, risk for the sake of risk, Tom, is, you know, it, it's a good thing. We wouldn't be where we are without risk, but also in understanding that uh, with that assumption of risk, the institution might go down as well. Uh, might temper decision making a little bit, uh, particularly uh, uh, on the trading side and the development of fancy finan uh, financial instruments. 
Cool. I think the, the easiest answer, but also the best political strategy and the best substantive answer is all of the above. And I, I mean, we, we have a system that encourages too much risk and those that are the, the you know, the SIFI, the, 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 the banks that can cause the most damage. Uh, and that's why I think that, that the, you know, the path we take is, is sort of all of the above, both in terms of political strategy, um, because there, is, there are different kind of coalitions of support in the Senate so far, and I think among a lot of um, people that are interested in this for different approaches, and, uh, and I think all of those approaches have merit and should sort of be worked on um, both independently and cooperatively. So um, I guess I'd just say all the above in the easy out answer. Yeah. It's not easy if you're willing to carry water for it in the Senate. Um, so thank you all for coming this morning. I think we did have a extremely engaging discussion on a critical issue in which there are obviously other points of view out there, but it is, really is a fascinating thing to have Senator Brown, Governor Huntsman, Professor Baer come together, all of them with a different political and experience backgrounds to talk about this issue so deeply and special thanks to Simon Johnson and to INET for helping us put this together and we'll look forward to seeing you again at another event very soon thank you all very much thank you.